Well, good afternoon. I'd like to um, start off by thanking the Institute of Acoustics for inviting me to give this talk today. And also, of course, for the award of the Rayleigh Medal. It, it's a very humbling experience to look at the list of previous winners. Um, it's also a very daunting task to try and give a talk at that kind of level, but I shall do my best. And what I'd like to do is um, not really present any brand new material, but present some material that I've been involved with in one way or another of the last 20 to 30 years. And it's concerned with the vibroacoustic analysis of systems that have uncertain properties, really from the point of view of providing information for design. So just to see where that kind of fits into that bigger picture. This is a very sort of top level simplification of the design process where we might need to design a plane, a, a car, some kind of engineering artifact. And the way we do that is to look at the design requirements and then come up with some kind of preliminary design. And then having done that, we need to assess the fitness of the design. And the way we would have done that many years ago would have been to build a prototype and do physical testing. But of course, these days, um, we find that that's too expensive. So what we'd rather do is build some sort of, some sort of computational or mathematical model and do virtual prototyping and then iterate the design in that way. So we'd run our model here and then we'd get output from the model and we decide that the design was acceptable, not acceptable, and so on. So what I'm talking about today really fits inside this box here for vibroacoustics. So it's a way of trying to assess whether a, a design system is fit for purpose. Now, before I get into vibroacoustics, I'd like to kind of set the scene historically a little bit by looking at an example problem that isn't fibroacoustics. So if you'll excuse me for about five minutes or so, I'm going to take a detour into aeronautics, but then I'll come back to vibroacoustics after that. And the kind of example I'd like to take from history is, is this one here, which is the R100. Um, from 1925 to 1930, the government funded two airship developments. One was the R100 that was built in the private sector. The other was the R101 that was built in the public sector. And this of course is the R100. And the reason this is interesting is that in those days, there wasn't any kind of design rules for airships. So the designers had to rely on some pretty unique calculations, uh, bespoke calculations to see if the airship would be safe. And what they had to do was design the airframe, and this is what the airframe looked like, to withstand the flight loads on the system. Now, what makes this quite a difficult structure is if you look carefully, you can see some wires here, and these are tensioned wires to stabilize the structure. Now, under certain loading conditions, some of these wires would go slack, and then under the other loading conditions, other wires would go slack, and it means that it's essentially a non-linear structure. So they have to come up with a design assessment tool that dealt with that non-linearity rather than just use design codes. So how did they do that? Well, the, the chief kind of um, person in charge of the structural analysis was this chap here, Neville Shoot Norway, or as he's better known, Neville Shoot, who became a very famous novelist. Um, as well as writing novels, he wrote a really interesting autobiography, which is this thing here called Slide Rule. And in the autobiography, he explains how they did the analysis of the airframe. And he starts off with this statement here. So he kind of says that the calculations were done by a pair of calculators. And you think, well, that's pretty good. I didn't know they had calculators in 1925. But this shows more the evolution of language. And in those days, a calculator was a person with a slide rule. So there are two people 
year working on the structural design or the structural analysis of the A-frame. And it took them two months, two or three months, to actually analyze the A-frame, doing iterations to allow for the non-linearity. Now, that quote we might expect. The next quote is a bit surprising, and it's the next quote that made me choose this example, even though it's nothing directly to do with fiber acoustics. So the next quote from the autobiography is this. It says, it produced the satisfaction, that's the calculation, or getting the answer, almost amounting to a religious experience. After literally months of labor, having filled perhaps 50 foolscap sheets with closely penciled figures, after many disappointments and heartaches, the truth stood revealed, real, perfect, unquestionable, the very truth. So that was an interesting view of the results of calculations. And it shows the degree of faith that Shute himself had in that kind of calculation. Well, that sets the scene for what we're going to look at today. And it's interesting to look at that and see how times have changed. So if we just think about calculation methods, well, of course, we don't use slide rules anymore. We tend to use computers, supercomputers quite often, PCs sometimes. Just to show how quickly things have changed, um, this is my slide rule from school. So when I was 14, 15 years old, we didn't have calculators at school. We used these things, slide rules, basically logarithms on a sliding scale to do the calculations. So we've gone from slide rules to computers, which means we've gone from pieces of full scalp paper, as Neville Shute would have said, um, to computer models, computer meshes. So what does that change meant for the quotations from Neville Shute? Well, the first quotation is fairly obvious. So we've got very uh, sophisticated models. Has that made life um, complete for us? Has that solved all of our problems? Well, not really, because the more computer power we get, the harder the problems we try and tackle. So we're never kind of satisfied. I'm sure in 20 years time, when we have even uh, another generation of computer uh, capabilities, we'll still be struggling to solve the problems that we're setting ourselves. So that's, that's one big change. The other big change though, and more interesting today is this uh, change to the religious experience. And to be honest, what's happened there in this sense is that we've had a kind of loss of faith. So though we've got better computational methods, in some ways more sophisticated mathematical techniques, we believe them less. And the reason being that we've kind of appreciated more the effect of uncertainty and the fact that our computer models are never perfect representations of the real world. Now, if we go back to vibroacoustics, um, there's a really good example of that lower box in some classic results um, generated by Bob Bernhardt some years ago now. But that, that's such a nice illustration. W what he did was to take 98 trucks from a production line, pickup trucks, and he measured the same thing on each one. So he measured an input at the vibration mount leading to noise inside the cabin at the driver's ear position. And he compared the frequency response functions. Well, before he did that, he just compared experiments on the same vehicle, just to show that the experiments were repeatable. And they were, that the, the result isn't bad there. But when he then looked at the different trucks, he got this. So 98 different results bearing very little resemblance to each other. So from Neville Shute's point of view, where he might have had definite belief in one of those results, um, that wouldn't cover the other results. So even if we have one really good computer model that might predict one vehicle, it's not telling us the full story. So what we'd like to have is an analysis method or a set of methods that actually allow us to model the whole thing here. Okay, so how might we go about that? Well, there's a kind of direct route, which I guess everybody knows, and that's to say, well, let's take the finite element method 
and let's randomize our model and just do lots of calculations with different random inputs and that will give us the kind of cloud of results that we saw in Bob Bernhardt's experiments. And then we can use that for design by looking at the possibility of failing to meet requirements. Well, although that sounds reasonable, and, and it often is reasonable, often it isn't reasonable. There are two reasons. One is that our model here may have 10 million degrees of freedom, so it takes quite a while to solve. The turnaround time is slow. The other thing is that if we're going to solve that model 200 times, a thousand times in Monte Carlo, the turnaround time is obviously even slower. But not only that, we're going to have to randomize the model in some way that we've decided. So what are these uncertain properties? Is it the stiffness of spot valves? Is it the curvature of panels? What is it and do we have the information needed to really put in a realistic randomization of the model? So a few problems there with just a head on Monte Carlo analysis of a system. And what I'd like to do today is talk about a range of alternative methods that try and get over those difficulties. And the methods I'm going to be talking about are centered on something called statistical energy analysis, which I know many of you will be familiar with, but I'll assume that you're not just in case anyone isn't. And what I'd like to do is kind of build towards the full complicated kind of model of a structure like a truck in a very slow way. So what I'd like to do in the talk is start off by analysing a very simple structure such as a plate. I then like to talk about coupled structures, two plates. Then I'd like to throw in a bit of complication by having some very stiff components in the system and some very soft lightweight components, what we call a hybrid structure. And then having done that, I'd like to get on to realistic systems. So to make a start with the plate structures and just understand some of the physics involved in this kind of problem, what I've got here are three plates, or actually the same plate, that's been randomised in three different ways. So if the plate is Bob Bernhardt's pickup truck, the randomization might be things like spot welds and so on. But in this case, it's been simplified to either putting random edge springs on, putting 10 point masses on in random positions, putting five point masses on in random positions. In, in each case, these things have been moved around 200 times to give us 200 different structures. And this gray cloud of results here are results for the kinetic energy of the plate as a function of frequency repeated 200 times. And so we get a cloud of results looking a bit like the results that Bob Bernhardt got. And the coloured lines on the plot are actually the averages of those curves. So what we've done is just take the average kinetic energy from the cloud of results. Now when you sit back and, and look at that, one thing that kind of seems apparent is that the coloured lines seem to be about the same even though we randomise these things in quite different ways. Now, if we actually take those coloured lines off the plots and put them together, we find they're very much the same. So regardless of how we've randomised the plate, we seem to get the mean response. The other thing is that the kind of size of the cloud seems to be the same. And in fact, we can measure that by measuring the standard deviation or the variance of the response. And again, we find that all three plates seem to have the same variance. Now, if we forget these black lines for the moment, they're going to be results of theory I'm going to talk through. That the interesting thing at the moment is the physics. Why should these three different randomizations produce almost the same results? And the answer lies in something called universality which was extensively studied in physics in the quantum mechanics literature, looking at large Hamiltonians and the statistics of the eigenvalues of um, 
large random matrices. Well, that's all a bit abstract for us. So to bring that down to engineering, what universality says in, in our world is that if we take something like this plate and we randomize it, then obviously the natural frequencies become random. So if I have 200 plates with different mass positions, I have 200 sets of natural frequencies. What is the distribution statistically of those natural frequencies? Well, the universality says something amazing. It says no matter how you've randomized the plates, under certain conditions, the statistics is always the same, always the same distribution. And moreover, it depends on just one parameter, which is called N, the modal density, which is the average number of modes in a unit frequency band. So we kind of get this distribution for free. If we know what N is, and we do, that can be found very easily from asymptotic theory, then we kind of know the statistics of the natural frequencies. As long as the structure is random enough for this thing called universality to apply. And I'll say more about that later. And we find not only the natural frequencies have universal statistics, but the mode shapes do too. So we can kind of say that we know mathematically the distribution of the natural frequencies and the mode shapes. So can we use that to predict the statistics of the response of the panel? Well, we can, and, and the way we start off is to just write down the equation for the response of the panel. And here's the standard equation for the kinetic energy of the response. Omega n is the natural frequency, of course, for the nth natural frequency. A depends on the mode shape and the applied loading. And I've just combined those here to go this function h is this thing here. And A is something that depends on the, the mode chain. So the question is, given the statistics of the natural frequencies and the mode shapes from universality, can we get expressions for the mean and the variance of T? Well, in some ways it's easy. In other ways, it's difficult because you can imagine the maths explodes a little bit in trying to do that calculation. But luckily, there's a technique that makes the maths relatively easy. And that technique was developed by this chap, Stratonovich. And as part of his PhD, when he was a very young man, Stratonovich developed some aspects of random point process theory. And it's that that we can use to get very simple answers for our vibroacoustic problems. And what Stratonovich would say for our mean kinetic energy is this equation here. And he would say this for the variance. And you'll notice that the H function appears and we've decided we know what that is and it's relatively simple. The modal density appears as we've seen before in the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And the only other thing that appears is this G2 function, which comes out of the universal statistics. So we know H, we know G2, we know N, all we've got to do is do those integrals. If we do the first integral, we get this really simple result here. If we do the second integral, we get something that doesn't look so simple, but it actually is simple because it just depends on a couple of parameters. The main one being this thing, the model overlap factor. So we get simple results for the mean, simple results for the variance, the result for the mean, as I'll say in a few seconds, is the same as statistical energy analysis would give us. And what we can do is take those two curves, which are just closed form solutions, and plot them on our results that we had before, and that's what the black lines are. So without any knowledge of the cause of the randomness or, or any detailed calculations using FE or doing any Monte Carlo studies, we get those black curves as closed form solutions and they give us the answer. So that gives us some hope that maybe we can develop a method for more complex structures, which overcomes the problems of the Monte Carlo method that I mentioned earlier. So let's just, before we leave the single structure, just to say that if we do experiments, 
um, we find that the theory can be validated that way. These are results uh, that were obtained at uh, Virginia Tech uh, many years ago now, and it just shows that our variance equations agree reasonably nicely with some experimental respects for a random plate. So moving on from that, if we now say, okay, that was for a single structure, what happens if we have a couple structure? Well, what we have to do now is kind of move on to SEA. And just to say what SEA is, let's take a, an example of a car structure. The way we would model that with FE is to write this uh, deterministic set of equations here. If we had vibroacoustics, X would include uh, acoustic degrees of freedom as well as structural degrees of freedom. And as I mentioned before, we might have something like 10 million degrees of freedom in there, which is pretty unpleasant to solve, particularly if we have to do Monte Carlo. SEA, this other approach, takes a completely different view and says, let's forget the detail at the moment and let's divide the car into these quite large blocks, which we call subsystems. And instead of trying to find the response at every point in a subsystem, let's just try and look at the statistics of the energy of the subsystems. So each subsystem has a single variable, which is its vibrational energy, and we're trying to solve for that. And the way we solve for it is not by using Newton's laws or um, Hooke's law. We actually look at energy flow and the conservation of energy flow. So if I just illustrate that, not for a car in complete uh, form, but for two coupled plates, here are the SEA equations we would develop for the mean energy. And when SEA was first developed, it was developed to predict the ensemble mean. So here are the SEA equations for the mean energies in these two plates. And what's involved is some things we're familiar with. There's the model density again for each plate. There's the loss factor, there's the frequency of interest. What we kind of haven't come across in uh, conventional dynamics is this thing, eta ij or eta jk, called the coupling loss factor, which governs the energy flow between components. And it turns out that in an ensemble sense, the energy flow between components is usually proportional to the difference between the energy density which is defined as the energy divided by the model density. And we can usually find eta jk by using modal or wave propagation methods. So in fact, we know everything on the left hand side here. We can also find the power inputs from asymptotic methods. So we can solve these equations to get the average energy, ensemble average energy in our components. Well, we did that for the plate um, but we also got the variance for the plate. So is there a variance theory for SEA? And the answer is yes. So once we've solved for the mean energies, we can substitute into this equation that looks very complicated, but actually isn't at all. We kind of know everything that goes in here and we can then get the variance of the energy in each plate. Well, obviously I don't have time to derive this today but just to say that the equation is very easy to implement. And this R function is the one that we saw from Stratonovich, so we know what this is. Okay, well, does it work? Well, does it work for a simple structure? Well, here are two coupled plates. And um, what we've done here is do benchmark analyses by using FE, putting random masses on, doing 200 Monte Carlo simulations, and then getting the mean and the variance of the energy in each plate. And that's what these irregular lines are. And uh, what we've also done is an SEA model, and that's what the smooth lines are. Now, even for this simple structure, the FE model involved uh, tens of thousands of degrees of freedom. The SEA results came from inverting this two by two matrix and then implementing this equation here for the variance. And that gave us really good agreement with the Monte Carlo simulations. And again, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to use the calculator to do those calculations. They're so simple. So we still have hope that um, we've seen that we can do something for a single plate. 
we've seen that we can do things for couple plates. So do we now have a general method for doing analysis of general structures? Well, unfortunately not, because there's a catch. And uh, I'll talk about the catch now in terms of this kind of more complicated structure. And the catch comes in because the SEA assumptions and the various assumptions tend to rely on this universality idea. And for universality to be valid, we have to have enough randomization in the structure to shift the natural frequencies significantly. And that tends to be true at higher frequencies. So we can say that SCA tends to be good at high frequency. Conversely, FE is really good if we only want a few modes. We don't have very large models, large degrees of freedom. FE is really good at low frequencies. But that raises a potential gap between those two, which people have called the mid-frequency gap, where neither FE or SCA alone tends to be adequate. And a good example of that is this structure here, which is a train structure where we have a very heavy subframe with very few modes. So SEA is no good for that, but FE is very good. And then coupled onto the frame are these panels. Panels are light, lots of modes. SEA is very good for the panels. FEA isn't so good because we need so many degrees of freedom. So what we'd like to do is kind of combine FE and SEA into a single model. Before we do that, just to kind of illustrate why we can't just use SEA, he's a very simplified version of that train structure where what I've got is essentially just a heavy framework with some panels and masses that are randomized and moved around. And an input is put on the framework an output is measured on a panel. And if we just run it for one configuration of the masses, this is the result we get. If we run it for another configuration, we get this, then we get this, then we get this. And we can start to see a structure emerge. And if we do it enough and look at the average response, there's a very definite structure there. So what we're finding is that uh, whereas SEA wouldn't see that SEA at best would give us a smooth line through those plots. This very heavy framework, which doesn't have universal statistics, is dominating a large part of the physics of the response. So to try and model that kind of thing, ideally, what we'd like to do is have FE and SEA in the same model. And to do that, we'd have to have subsystems with energy variables coupled to FE systems with discrete degrees of freedom. So how can we couple SEA to FE? Well, again, I don't have time to go through this in detail today, but just to say that it can be done. And the basic idea behind it is that if we think of one of our SEA subsystems and we shake the boundary, that creates waves that go into the system. If we only had those waves, which we call the direct field, then life would be simple. We could get a stiffness matrix for shaking the boundary, which we would call the direct field dynamic stiffness matrix, and we can just use that. But of course, life isn't simple because the waves bounce around. And because we could have scattering things attached to the panel, or we could have uncertain boundary conditions, that scattering is random. So we get this random reverberant field, as we call it. So the boundary force has this nice direct field part and this not so nice reverberant field part. As an aside, the direct field stiffness matrix, we would call it, we can calculate by a variety of methods, um, one of which would be periodic structure theory. I won't go in that now, into that now, but suffice to say that it's not difficult to calculate this D direct, we can assume that it's known. So given that we know D direct, what can we say about F rev, the reverberant force? Well, the thing is it's random. So what we'd like to say is something about its statistics, for example, its mean squared value. Can we say anything about that? And it turns out it's, it's as amazing as universality that surprisingly 
we can say something very general about it. And that's that the cross spectrum of the reverberant forces is proportional to the direct field dynamic stiffness matrix. Now we know this, as I've just said, so we know this. So, and actually I should say that there's a constant of proportionality which depends on the energy. So if we know the energy of the reverberant field, we can get these reverberant forces. So what does that do? Well, it enables us to say that if we have a certain amount of energy in this panel, we can work out the way that energy is going to force the Fe structure. And suffice to say, we then have enough information to develop a set of global equations for our structure. And it turns out that the set of global equations look like this. It turns out that for the SEA subsystems, we get a set of SEA equations. For the Fe part of the structure, we get what's essentially a set of Fe equations, but they're squared up. So that we get an equation for the cross spectrum of the Fe response. But suffice to say, these are non-iterative. We just solve the equations and the building blocks are the Fe model of the Fe part of the structure, which we know, and the uh, direct field matrix, which we know. So given those things, we get all the other parameters in the model, and we call that the hybrid method. So what we can do with the hybrid method is predict the response of things like this. So the red line is the response of the hybrid prediction. We can also develop some uh, variance equations to go with the hybrid method. These are the response of the um, variance prediction for a hybrid structure compared to Monte Carlo results. And, and the nice thing about the hybrid method is that it gives us a lot of flexibility in modeling. So what I've got here is just a stiffened panel where everything is Fe. And if I just put a force here and measure the response at accelerometers here, then we find that we get that response. So that's normal Fe. But that might be quite expensive to run. I might want to do a Monte Carlo, which makes it more expensive. Or I might want to introduce an SEA subsystem. And I might do that by replacing that panel with SEA. So all those Fe degrees of freedom have been replaced with one SEA degree of freedom, the energy. And then that gives me this result using the hybrid method. Or I might be even more drastic and take away all of the degrees of freedom except the beams. And it gives me this model where I have SEA systems and it gives me this black line here. So it's up to the user, the degree of fidelity they want to keep in the model. So with this hybrid method, we can combine SEA and FE in a very flexible set of ways. So that's the basis of the method. Can it be applied to real structures? Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to computerize it and build up a, a code. And here's just three examples of codes that have been built to do that. The first one, uh, AutoC, was an SEA code developed by Vibroacoustic Sciences. That was subsumed into um, VA1. Uh, Vibroacoustic Sciences was acquired by ESI. So VA1 has the hybrid method in it. Um, the date at the top is just the launch date. Obviously, VA1 is constantly updated. Um, another code, Wave 6, has the hybrid method in it, currently uh, on by, now on by Dasso Systems. So there are two current codes out there that actually implement the hybrid method and variants of the hybrid method on very complicated structures. Just to say that I've had the privilege of working on all three of these things, and the greater privilege of working with some of the top people in industry on these projects. Um, Paul Brandner was the, uh, the founder of Vibra Acoustic Sciences, probably did more than anyone, maybe apart from Bob Manning. Bob Manning and Paul Brandner go together in terms of getting SEA out into industry, so a real pioneer of SEA software. Steve McDonald, really great guy, great pioneer in computational fluid dynamics and aero vibro acoustics, which led to uh, some of the developments that went into wave six and Phil Shorter, who's the, uh, the lead of wave six, um, who's developed that software. So it's been a great 
privilege to work with these three people. What I'd like to do is just end really by looking at one of those codes, wave six, to give an example of the kind of problem that can be solved. Here's Phil Shorter giving a talk, better talk than this one, on uh, the technology behind wave six. Here's a range of examples of wave six, uh, marine, automotive, aerospace, where the hybrid method and variants of it has been used to solve fiber acoustic problems. Just to take one example from wave six in particular, this is an aero vibro acoustic model of a car where the exterior noise was modeled by CFD, the side glass was modeled by FE, and the interior was modeled by finite, sorry, not finite, it was by SCA in terms of a number of subsystems or by a more advanced version of SCA that I don't have time to go into now, which is kind of a phase three boundary element method. But what we can see is that the, the SCA is giving a pretty nice prediction of the interior noise without having all of those uh, deterministic degrees of freedom in there. So almost time for me to stop. What I'd like to say is um, just that I've covered a small area. There are lots of different techniques. I've only focused on the techniques that I've been personally involved in. This was where I started out to say, to head off a question really, someone might say, well, what if the finite element model is random? What do we do then? Well, we can wrap this hybrid method in a Monte Carlo method where we have a small model and we just randomize the FE part so that we're dealing with uh, relatively few degrees of freedom. Okay, just my final comment would just be to say thanks. Phil Short has appeared twice already if you were looking on the slides. Um, these have been the main two people I've worked with uh, certainly over the last 20 years, uh, Phil Short and Vincent Catoni, both of them currently at, at Wave 6. So thanks to them and uh, thanks for you for listening. And of course, I'd be very happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you.